Right, um, this evening we're going to uh, look at another work that the Spirit of God does, and I think this is perhaps one of the, um, uh, well, they're all important, but perhaps one of the ones that um, we may think to be more important uh, to us personally, and that is how the Spirit of God uh, works within our lives to give us assurance uh, that we are in fact the children of God. Now, I've talked on the subject quite a bit, so I'm just going to hit um, the, uh, the highlights, and we can find it uh, in Romans chapter 8. I'd like to uh, read a, uh, a few verses of Romans chapter 8 as we get started. And it's kind of a big text to cover. We're not going to cover everything in it, but uh, we are going to see at least three things the Spirit of God uses um, through this text in our lives to show us that we are, in fact, uh, the children of God, that we are, in fact, saved. And again, as we, um, as we look at this evidence, uh, let's not forget that none of us are going to find this evidence in our lives perfectly. Uh, what we need to do is look for um, uh, the indication that it's there in some measure. Okay, but let's begin by reading the, uh, the passage in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. And as I read it, just keep this in mind because this is what we're looking at. What is it the Spirit of God does to show us that we are the children of God? Paul writes, there is, uh, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, <clears throat> but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Now that, that was a lot. It's, it's, um, it's kind of hard to sort through uh, everything that's in this text, but what I'd like to do is look at at least three things that the Spirit of God does in order to give us assurance. And uh, because of the amount of information that we're gonna have to cover, I think what I'm gonna do is just uh, tell you what those are and we'll begin to work our way through it. So. What does the Spirit of God do in our lives in order to show us that we are the heirs of eternal salvation? Again, I, I believe Paul gives us at least three things. The first one is by his leading. The second one is by his testimony. And the third one, I think, is at least implied at the end by his, willing, by his making us willing to suffer uh, for God's glory. So let's begin with the Spirit testifies that we are his children by his leading. And I think really most everything 
in the text. I should probably just open this up so I can have this at hand. In Romans chapter 8, in most of the verses we look at, I think they have to do primarily with his leading us. Okay. All right. So the question is, how can you know whether or not he is leading you? Now, let me just draw a little bit of the context here to begin with. Paul begins by telling us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Back in Romans chapter 7, uh, he is reviewing for us some kind of a struggle. It's sometimes difficult to understand exactly what he's saying. Some believe he's referring to his condition prior to becoming a Christian, that as a Jew he loved the law, but yet he found himself still struggling with, uh, with sin under bondage to sin, it seems. Uh, others believe that he's referring to a Christian who is struggling with the desire to uh, follow uh, the Lord or to follow his flesh, and I, I think that's probably the way I've probably uh, tended to lean most of the time. But then he gives us good news in, in the midst of the struggle in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that if we are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation for us. If God hadn't done something to intervene, if he hadn't dealt with the guilt and power of sin, uh, we would have been condemned. But Paul says that he did deal with it so that if we are in Jesus Christ, we will not be condemned. Now, I believe Paul goes on to, to answer the question why, but I think he does it more from the perspective of the evidence uh, that we can know that there's no condemnation for us in the Lord Jesus Christ if certain things are going on in our lives, rather than pointing directly to uh, the cause here. Actually, he does deal with the cause somewhat, but I think he focuses mainly on the evidence, the evidence that there is no condemnation for us. Otherwise, being led by the Spirit would be, you know, a cause of our salvation. I don't think it is. I think it's the evidence that we're saved. I think it's part of the fruit that we're born again. Okay. Now, Paul points to this evidence in verse 2, which let me just uh, say, I think towards the end of this text in verse 14, I think is a summary of everything that we see leading up to verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. In verse 2, he says this, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. That is, I think, a prerequisite to being led by the spirit. Now, let's try to understand what Paul is talking about here. What do you think he means by the law of sin and death? The law of the spirit of life has set us free from that particular law. What law is that? Anybody have any ideas? That's exactly right. I think many would, would tend to say, well, it's, it's the Ten Commandments. Uh, it, he's set us free from the Ten Commandments, so we don't need to keep the commandments. That's the law that's written on stone that can only bring death. But yet that's not what he's referring to. He's referring to something else. He's referring to the flesh. He's referring to that desire that we have within us that we're born with for evil. The same thing that makes us want to go after the world. The same thing as John is distinguishing between the love that, is, that a person may have for the Father versus the love for the world. And he describes what's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the things that the flesh desires. Now, what is the law of the spirit of life then? I'm sorry, you had a question, honey? Well, we could um, point to what Paul says about the law in Romans chapter 7, which we're going to look at a few of those quotes in just a little bit, that the law is holy, righteous, and good, and it's not the law's fault that, that I'm in the situation that I'm in. It's my sin. Uh, we could point to what Jesus says about uh, the law in, in Matthew chapter 5, that he didn't come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill it. And then he goes on to lift the law back up to where it used to be. You've heard it said that I say to you, we, we could go you know, that particular route. We could also point out that um, Paul tells us in Romans 13, I think it is, that everything that the law tells us to do can be summarized by love. 
and I think most people would agree that we're supposed to love. So we can go at it several different ways uh, to point that out. Plus, most of the, most of the uh, reasons or most of the texts in Scripture that people use to, to say that the law is no longer binding really points to the ceremonial law rather than the moral law. But again, it may take a little while to develop that, that argument. But we're going to see a few of those things as we go on. Now, I think I asked the question, what is the law of the spirit of life then? Exactly right. That new principle that is placed there by the Spirit of God that we've seen already many times can be summarized by love. That love breaks the power of the flesh because it turns our hearts toward the Lord and away from sin. And so that sets us free from our bondage. Now Paul tells us that if we have this principle of the Spirit of God within us, then we are free from the principle of the flesh. We are no longer in bondage. And as a corollary, he says, we can know that we are no longer under condemnation. Now, again, we're trying to um, uh, see how the Spirit of God, how, how he ministers basically the confidence to us that we belong to him, that we are saved, that we're no longer condemned. Those are synonymous. If we're no longer condemned, then we are saved. So how can we know? Well, the Spirit of God, the principle of the Spirit, the law of the Spirit of God, that love within us has broken the power of the flesh by giving to us a love for something we did not have before. Now, the fact that the Spirit of, uh, or the law of the Spirit has um, set us free from the law of sin and of death, let me just ask this question. Does that mean that we no longer are troubled by the flesh? The flesh no longer has any power over us and that we are free to, to just do what the Lord would have us to do. Okay, now, we know that the Bible teaches us that the old man still has power. There's still corruption in our hearts. And because there is corruption in our hearts, we're still going to have some desire for sin. But are we in bondage to sin? Do we have a choice? Okay, we're not, we're not in bondage. Do we have a choice of whether we're going to obey the Lord or not? Does the unbeliever have such a choice? The unbeliever has a choice of different sins to commit. The believer has a choice of whether he's going to submit to the Lord or whether he's going to give in to sin. Sadly, we do sometimes give in to sin, and even our best obedience is still uh, you know, far from perfect. So the flesh is still very much alive. Now, Paul goes on to answer the question how we got this principle, this new principle of the Spirit. Now, he says it wasn't through the law of God. Um, let's see. Look at um, verse 3. Now, this is one of the reasons why there's the confusion of what law he's referring to here is because here he actually does talk about the law of God. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Now, Paul tells us that the law was not able to save us. Which law do you think he's talking about there? Ten Commandments, right? Now, why couldn't the law save us? What's that? Because we can't keep it, basically. It, you know, it's not that there was any problem with the law, but the problem's with us. Uh, when you look at um, the, um, uh, in the book of Hebrews, when the Lord is talking about um, the bringing in the new covenant, uh, he talks about the old covenant, that there really wasn't anything wrong with that covenant. The fault was with the people. They didn't have the ability to keep the law. And we don't have the ability to keep the law either because as we come into this world, we're only flesh. And flesh doesn't have the ability to keep the law of God. As a matter of fact, uh, we read a little bit further on that um, the mindset on the, on, the, uh, on the flesh is death. The mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God for it does not subject itself to the law of God for it is not even able to do so. So while we're in the flesh, we cannot keep 
the commandments of God. Now, here's an interesting question. If we had been able to keep the law perfectly, could we have been justified by keeping it? Could we be saved by keeping the law? Theoretically. Why not? Okay, because of Adam's sin. We're already guilty, right? Even if we had come into this world and kept the law from day one all the way to the end of our lives, we'd still have the guilt of Adam. And not only that, we still have the corruption of heart that makes everything we do imperfect. But if we had come into this world perfect, could we have been justified by keeping the law if we had done it perfectly? What's that? We wouldn't need the law? Uh, well, I guess... Um, that's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, Adam was perfect, and he was given a law, um, and he disobeyed that law. So that type of perfection apparently didn't rule out the possibility of, of uh, disobedience. So he still needed to be informed of the standards, and of course, having been informed of the standard, then his heart would incline him towards doing what it is God called, or what God called him to do. But but again, the question is, if we had been born like Adam, let's say, with a clean slate, and not with a kind of perfection that would keep us from falling. If we had obeyed the law of God perfectly throughout our lives, would we, or could we be justified in that way? I think so. Otherwise, what would we do with the covenant of works? I mean, that's what Adam was supposed to do. And, and of course, Jesus, he justified us by his perfect obedience. So uh, now, if he had been just a man, his obedience would be good just for himself. But since he's the God-man, he can give that righteousness uh, to us. So yes, we could have. But the first question, though, uh, we have Adam's sin to deal with. So even if we could have, which we couldn't have, but even if we could, we still couldn't save ourselves in the condition in which we were born. So we read that what we were not able to do, God did. And what he did was he sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with our sins. Okay. Now, what, um, what are the things that Jesus Christ did to save us? Let's just review those. There's two main things. Okay. So he lived a perfect life to provide a perfect righteousness for us, and he died on the cross to atone for our sins. Now, notice what uh, Paul says is the result of that in verse 3. It says that uh, God did, if you pick it up there, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now, I do believe that that, that condemnation of sin in the flesh uh, doesn't have to do with the judicial action in which he can, well, condemns sin, although certainly he takes it out of the way, but I think it has something to do with his, through his work, he breaks the power of sin in our lives. He condemns the sin that is in us and destroy, well, doesn't, uh, doesn't destroy it in this life, but at least breaks its power over us so that, he says, that well, again, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, what do you think he means here by the requirement of the law being fulfilled in us? Do you think he's talking about being given Christ's perfect righteousness, or is it talking about something else? What do you think is, is the context here that Paul's referring to? Is he talking here about the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ by which we are saved, the perfect righteousness credited to us, God looks at it and says, you're perfect. Is that what he has in mind here? Well, I think so, because look at what follows there. It says, so that the requirement of the, of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The whole, I think, thrust of what Paul's getting to here is the fact that the spirit of God has broken the power of sin in our lives and that the law of God is being fulfilled in us, not 
I mean, it is certainly imputed to us. We know that. Okay? That's how we're saved. But I think he's talking here about a change of life throughout this whole text. That the power of sin is broken and that the Spirit of God is working within us the requirements of the law. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? In other words, he's helping us to obey. Can we agree that that's what he has in, in view here? Okay. Now, let's see. These are the things that, the, well, that Paul says that the Lord has done for us. If you're trusting Jesus Christ, and the reason why you're not condemned. Now, I think I told you that I think Paul is, he, certainly he's referring to the work of Jesus Christ here that saves us. But I think more than that, he's pointing to the evidence by which we might know that we are saved. And how can you, how can you know any of these things are true about you? Okay, we, we talked about the things that Jesus Christ did. Okay, he, he obeyed in order that he might give us a perfect righteousness. Now, if you trust in Jesus Christ, do you have a perfect righteousness? Okay, can, by looking at yourself, can you tell that you do? I mean, if, can, you, can you see the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to you? Can you see that? Can, can, can you see it here? I mean, it's a, you know, I mean, we can't see it, right? It's, that's invisible. It's, it's, it, it is true of us if we're trusting, but it's not something we can see. Now, can you also, if Jesus Christ, you know, died for your sins, if you're trusting him, your sins are forgiven, can you tell by looking that your sins are forgiven? You know, I mean, I can't tell by looking at you, so it's not something that's visible, right? No. But can you tell by looking at each other whether or not the power of sin is broken? Can we tell, you know, whether or not the requirement of the law is being fulfilled in us? Is that visible or invisible? Okay. Right, and if that fruit isn't there, what will we conclude? The person's not saved. Uh, Sarah, were you going to say something? Uh, well, right now we're talking about people who are saved as far as whether you can see forgiveness or you can see the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Those things are invisible. You can't see them. Okay. Well, that's, that's what we're talking about here. Now, when the righteousness, the righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled in us by the Spirit of God who breaks the, the reigning power of sin, sets us free from sin, and begins to fulfill the law in us, that's something that you should be able to see, right? That's something that's visible. So that becomes an evidence, doesn't it? It becomes an evidence. As a matter of fact, Jonathan Edwards' book, Religious Affections, toward the end of the book, he says that is the main evidence. That is evidence not only to us, but it's also evidence to others that we are actually born again of God. So this is one way you can know you have the Spirit when you see yourself walking in the commandments of God, obeying the commandments of God. If you don't see that, then you can't really be sure that you're a believer. Now, just following up on what uh, Kathy began to uh, hedge toward, do you think that if a person is simply, um, you know, just outwardly obeying the commandments, do you think that that's what Paul is talking about here? Jonathan Edwards talked about in his day, although it would have been very primitive, but he would say that you can make, uh, like, he wouldn't call it a robot, but something like that, to go through certain motions. But that is not necessarily obedience, is it? Just because it's going through certain motions, and the same thing is true. For us, the motions are not enough. What else has to be there? What's that? That's right. You have to have the right motive. You have to do it for the glory of God. And in order to do it for the glory of God, what else has to be in your heart? It has to be that love. So these commandments need to be kept from the heart if we are to have the kind of obedience that Paul is talking about here that actually shows us that we are children of God. Does that make sense? Uh, by the way, here's, um, here's a few passages. Uh, Sarah was telling you we'd, we'd come up with these. How can you show someone that, um, that we still need to keep the commandments of God 
and that you know, Paul's not condemning those commandments. Well, Paul says in, in Romans 7.22, I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. He says in verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. John says in 1 John 5.3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119.97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Now, that last one, it, people who want to reject the law of God won't accept that because that's in the Old Testament. But these others are in the New Testament, and the law that John is referring to, for instance, and that Paul is referring to, is the moral law, the Ten Commandments. Sure, uh, real quickly, Romans 7, verse 22 also verse 12 of that same chapter, and 1 John 5, 3. Um, and then the, uh, the one from Psalm 119, actually the whole psalm, but Psalm 119, verse 97. So all of these things indicate a, a joy, a love for the law of God, and that's what the Spirit of God does. Now, if the Spirit of God puts love in your heart for something, then your life is going to incline that direction. You're going to think about it. That's why the psalmist says, I, I meditate on your law all the day. They have mentioned before, I ran into somebody one time who uh, got upset because I was preaching through the Ten Commandments and uh, one time said, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of hearing about the law. And uh, I said, well, that's... That's kind of troublesome because um, you know, we're only going through it once, once a week on a Sunday evening and maybe for a half an hour. And I said the psalmist loved to meditate on it all day long, every day. Well, that's the kind of attitude we should have toward the law. It, it doesn't condemn us anymore in Jesus Christ, but rather it shows us how we might love, honor, and serve him. And if we love the Lord for his holiness and the law of God reflects that holiness, we will love that law. If we know it pleases the one we love, then we will love to keep it, okay? So our attitude toward the law will be love, and if we love the law, we will keep the law. If we're actually keeping the law because we love it, that means the Spirit of God, principle of the Spirit has broken the, uh, the law of sin and the flesh so that we can know that we are saved. By the way, Paul goes on to give us a little bit more about this change in verses 5 through 13. I'm just going to kind of go through these quickly. But in verse 5, he says, Those who are according to the flesh, who are in the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those are the unholy things. Those are the things of sin, evil of the world. They're hostile toward God. They do not subject themselves to the law of God, which is what we would expect. By the way, you can prove then that um, we ought to keep the law of God because someone who's in the flesh refuses to subject themselves to the law of God. It says, Paul says, that they're not even able to do so. And for that reason, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, verse 7. But those in the spirit, uh, both explicitly and by way of implication, set their minds on the things of the spirit, verse 5. They love God. And so they subject themselves to his law. They seek to please him. They also seek to put to death, in verse 13, their sins, because they know their sins are offensive to God. By the way, are, are our sins offensive only to God? Who else should our sins offend? Well, certainly we'll do that. Anyone else? Should offend us, right? We should hate them too and seek to get rid of them. So Paul tells us again in verse 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. How can you know you're being led by the Spirit of God? Well, sins are broken, your desire for sin, it's offensive to you now, even though there's still some desire for it, you really hate it, want to be rid of it, you love the Lord, you want to keep the commandments, you want to please Him. If that's happening to you, you are being led by the Spirit. That is His leading. Uh, by the way, is there another way the leading of the Spirit is understood in churches today, perhaps of the charismatic persuasion? How, how would they define the leading of the Spirit? 
exhibition of gifts. Mm -hmm. And uh, how does it work into the decision-making process? Do they scour the Word of God and seek to apply that to the situation, or what do they usually do? Experience? Yeah. They say, like, I feel like the Spirit's telling me to do this, or I feel like the Spirit's leading me to do this, or I feel bad about this or good about this, and so I'm, I interpret that as the leading of the Spirit. Uh, but that could just be the tyranny of our emotions. I'm thinking that in many cases it is. The Spirit leads us through the Word of God. He also leads us through providence, open and closed doors. And I'm not saying there isn't any sense in which He may move us to do one thing or another, but we need to be very careful because um, we don't have a book and chapter, as it were, for those particular inclinations, and so we need to be you know, somewhat cautious when we feel like Spirit's leading you to do this or do that. Certainly, you don't want to direct your whole life that way. Okay. So, anyway, this, we would say this, um, let's see, where am I? Uh, this is the seal of his ownership. Uh, verse 9. Let's see. Okay. All right, so anyway, this particular testimony of the Spirit of God in our hearts is one, well, let me ask you this question. Uh, as we consider this ministry of the Spirit and this testimony to us that we are the children of God, is this um, subjective or objective? Is it internal or external? Is it internal or external? Objective, subjective. This, this witness of the Spirit to us, is this external only? Is it internal only? Is, what, what is it? It's both, okay? This is both, isn't it? This is something that, well, I, I believe that uh, Jesus tells us is one way by which others can look at us and know that we're the children of God. Didn't Jesus say, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another? And that love is not just kind of a warm, gushy feeling, oh, I love you, you know. But it's seen. It's a love that's seen you know, by how we minister to one another, encourage one another, and help one another, and so forth. And obviously, our love for God will also be seen. Jesus told us that we should do our works in such a way that men see it and give glory to God, which means this love produces good fruits, that will be seen by others and will be a testimony to others. So it's external. But because we do it out of love, that's also an internal. There's an internal aspect to it as well. Now, the second evidence that's in our text is to how the Spirit of God testifies to your sonship, to the fact that you're saved, to the fact that you belong to Him, you're safe, I think is mainly internal in verses 15 and 16. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Does anybody know what, what, this, what this is that Paul's referring to? How, how does this witness of the Spirit work? Yes, that's, that's probably the, the main thing that's there. And then why does it say here that we've received a spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father? What, how does that figure into it? Yes, what you said is very true. Uh, we love the Lord and the, and the broken power of sin, the fact that we're no longer slaves to sin. Certainly, that's true. And then what about the, the crying out of Abba Father? Does that come into it anywhere? Does that, is there any way that that bears witness to us, that we are children of God?
You know, I, I just barely hear you. I'm not sure that what exactly what you said. Can you summarize that in a sentence? Okay. Uh, can anyone relate the assurance directly to these words, Abba Father, if you understand what I'm looking for? Sure. Okay, that's that's right. There's just just one little, little other thing here. Is is okay? He gives us the love and affection. We feel that sense of it and so forth. And you, you actually did bring it up. We we don't just say my God, but we say Father, right? And Abba is is another word for Father as well. There's this filial experience, this relationship that we know that we have with the Lord that we're in his family, as you said, so that we can say Father and, and we can say it knowing that it's true. There, there's a certain, I think, witness of the Spirit there that tells us that we are the children of God because we're able to say that and know that he is our Father. I mean, there are people who can, who can say the word, but the Spirit isn't going to give them the confidence to actually believe that that's true of them. But if you're a true child of God, he does give you that sense that he really is your father and you really are his child. And, and certainly it is purely a love relationship. We, we know his love and we sense love for him as well. So now is this an internal or external uh, witness of the spirit? This one's purely internal, except of course, if somebody hears you say <laughs> father, but um, they won't be able to see what, what's actually going on here if the spirit is giving you that type of confidence. Because again, anyone can, can go through the motion. Anyone can say, Jesus is Lord, for instance. But if, since, if a person says, Jesus is Lord, does that mean that they're saved? Well, no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Spirit of God, right? So if some unbeliever says, Jesus is Lord, is, is that by the Holy Spirit? No. It's only if he says it and he knows in his heart that it's true, he has that firm conviction, the Spirit of God generates that, but it's not just because the person says the words any more than the person says Father means that they have the witness of the Spirit. But saying it and knowing that it's true. Okay. All right, uh, the last evidence is in verse 17, I think. And I think it's implied here. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may or so that we may also be glorified with him now if if we were to let's say try to figure out a witness of the spirit from this particular text what would that witness be what would what would it be that the spirit of god produces that gives you an assurance that you are saved suffering you know it it actually does say suffering doesn't it the fact that we suffer. If indeed we suffer with him. Um, now again, different people will suffer at different levels. And uh, certainly the uh, disciples in those days and certain Christians throughout the world today have to suffer a great deal. But every Christian 
will suffer. And as far as our willingness to suffer, what, if we are truly born again, what will the Spirit of God give us the grace to do? He will give us the grace to be willing to suffer. How far? How far will we be willing to suffer? Unto death. That's right. Jesus says in Luke 14, verses 26 and 27, perhaps some of the hardest words that um, are in Scripture. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. By the way, are there Christians who are not disciples? No. no. It's not a two-tier... Um, you know, it's not two levels of Christianity. I'm saved and I'm a disciple. And there are many who actually do divide those. You come to the front, you pray the prayer, and you know you supposedly trusted in Jesus Christ. You're saved, and then you go out and live the way that you used to live, and no change takes place. They'd say that person is still saved. But Jesus says, unless you're a disciple, unless you pick up your cross and follow after me, unless you hate, by comparison, those whom you love the most in the world, even your own life. You can't follow me. You can't be my disciple. You can't be saved. The Spirit of God gives you that kind of love that you would be willing to do that. You would be willing to pay whatever you have to pay. You'd be willing to give up even your closest relations in order to follow him, although he's not going to call you to do that necessarily, although he may, if, if they happen to be unconverted, uh, at, uh, the price may be that high. But you also have to be willing to lay down your life. So this, I would say, is the third witness of the Spirit, the seal of suffering, the willingness to suffer in the place of our Lord Jesus Christ, to suffer for doing what's right. Uh, what is the thing that perhaps, uh, as Christians, we would have to suffer the most in following Jesus? Just think about it for a minute. In our society today, what, what would be the greatest source of that suffering? I think that, that gets to uh, pretty close to what I'm looking for. Yeah, mocking. What does mocking imply? Are you, are you a part of the group or not a part of the group? They stand apart from you and they, they separate from you and they see you as something different and that's why they mock you, right? I think separation from... Others, uh, alienation, is probably one of the, the greatest things we have to suffer. But do we suffer that automatically? As you're walking down the street to somebody say, there goes a Christian. I see the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I see the sins forgiven. Now, they don't look at you and they don't see like a halo over your head and, and say, that's a Christian, I hate him or I hate her. But what is it they see that creates the alienation? Yeah, and how do they see that? That's right. That's right. You're you're different, aren't you? You, you stand out. You don't join in with the rest of what's going on because you, you can't. Um, the Lord tells us, come out from among them and be separate. And the fact is, as you, well, as you just simply be a Christian, as you respond, you know, you don't hide your candle under a bushel, but instead you actually speak. And you say things that are different. And you don't join in with what they're doing. You stand apart from that and so forth. You'll find that you'll be alienated. That's what happens because they don't like it. And they don't like it when you speak the truth because it convicts them, and because it, um, they don't like you know, having their sins exposed. That's why the darkness hates the light and won't come to the light. So if, if the Spirit of God has uh, broken the power of sin in your life and he is fulfilling the law of God in you so that you are becoming like Jesus Christ, it's going to become apparent. And as it does, you're going to suffer. And again, mainly today, alienation. but. Um, and maybe some ridicule, some mocking, and so forth. But um, in some countries, they kill you. And in certain times in history, they kill you. And the question is, are you willing 
to do that. If you are, then that is a mark the Spirit of God is working in you because that's the only thing he will allow you to do. But if, um, if you're not willing to do that, then that says something else about your character. Now, again, we're not going to do any of these things perfectly. We're all going to struggle in all these areas. We struggle with being alienated from, from, from other people. It's, it's hard. It's always hard to stand out. It's always hard to be a, a group of one, you know, if you're the only Christian among those people. I worked in a, in a high school as a custodian for six years while I was going through educational process and so forth, and I had to work with, with the whole crew during the summers. And it, usually at the beginning of the summer, we'd all start off sort of together, but little by little, I eventually become a group of one, and uh, you know, the, the object of ridicule and so forth. At first, they're a little bit intimidated, but after they get comfortable, they start start going at you, making fun and so forth. Well, that's a small price to pay, I think, isn't it? For uh, eternal life and being owned as one of the Lord's. But again, it's not a price we pay so much, but something we have to do because love dictates that I can't dishonor my Lord by standing with these people and doing what they're doing, but I need to love the Lord and I need to love them by doing what's right by telling them the truth, by saying things they're not necessarily going to like. You know, when you speak the truth, um, you need to say it in love and let them know you're, you care about them, and it, it'll make a difference. I mean, they won't maybe come after you really strong you know, if you're not just drilling it into them, but if you speak it gently and in love, they're still not going to like it, but hopefully they'll at least understand you care about them, but it will alienate you. And you will find when they get together with one another that uh, you'll become the brunt of their jokes. So anyway, I think these are perhaps the main ways the Spirit of God actually ministers to us the fact that we're saved. Uh, the fact that we love the Lord and we begin to do what the Lord would have us to do, that we're willing to suffer for doing that. And um, that, um, as we just, um, oh yeah, the witness of the Spirit, that when we call God our Father, we have the confidence that that, that is true. But this change of life, this love for the Lord to the point where it actually changes the way you live, that is the main evidence that you are a child of God, is that you are bearing good fruit. I think that's probably the main thing. Okay, well anyway, that's another ministry of the Spirit, and you can see how it's tied to His nature. He works His nature in us, His particular nature, His particular fruit is love. And that love produces a change in our lives that can be seen by others to the point where we suffer for it. Any, um, any questions, any comments before we uh, close and spend some time in prayer? Okay. All right then, well that'll certainly give us some things to pray about that the Lord will strengthen us in that love so that we do stand out and are not afraid to do so. All right, well, let's, let's have a word of prayer as we close.